My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favour some people over others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewellery and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonour the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures. Love your neighbour as yourself. But if you favour some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. For the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as a person who's broken all of God's laws. For the same God who said, you must not commit adultery, also said, you must not murder. So if you murder someone but do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. The most beautiful thing that I've ever seen in a church was on a Sunday. A Sunday morning where a single mum in the middle of a messy divorce had just given birth to a baby that was not her husband's. Her previous church had kicked her out and they banned her from even entering the building and she had rocked up at this other church broken, hurting and completely repentant wanting to pursue God again. And they took her in and they made her a valued part of their family. The Sunday after the baby was born at her new church, they stopped the worship time halfway through, and the church elder pointed to the mother and baby said, as part of our worship here today, we just want to welcome them and pray for them. We celebrate them amongst us. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen on a Sunday. We just heard a passage from chapter 2 of the book of James that we're working through on Sundays at the moment. And that passage, it challenges us deeply. Now it reads a little like one of those maths questions that you get in school, okay? You know the one where you've spent a week learning all the theory and then you get to the Friday with this theoretical question where it says, if a train leaves Eastley at 10.40 and arrives at Southampton Central at 11.05, what colour is the driver's girlfriend's hair? You know the one? But in this example, we are asked, what if, what if a church had a special seat for visual effect? This is actually my favorite chair from my house. My kids walked here this morning. Um, What if a church had a special seat for favored, in particular rich people, and put those less favored on the floor? What does that show you about church. Now James, who was half-brother of Jesus and a leader in the early church, he might be talking in concepts, but there's no doubt he's actually seen this. He's actually seen favoritism in the church, in particular rich over poor, and he knows it needs addressing. He thinks it's the ugliest thing you could see in a church. And actually it's been an issue in churches ever since. I don't know if any people here have ever felt favoritism. Maybe you were the favourite, um, favoured eldest child with the biggest room and the biggest piece of chicken or whatever at lunch. Or maybe you felt overlooked at school or at work. But I'm sure you'd agree one of the most painful places to ever feel this is in the church. So my sermon today is called, Who's in the Good Seat? And I want to try and answer three questions today. Number one, who is on God's heart? Number two, who's in the good seat? And number three, who's on our heart? So first, who's on God's heart? Well, first, you need to know about something. You need to know about God's kingdom. 
Now, if you're new to church, you may not have heard this phrase. It's a probably less understood side to Christianity. The truth is that Jesus talked about God's kingdom all the time. Jesus came as a king to build and reign in a new kingdom where God's will and way were on display for everyone. The crazy thing about this kingdom, though, was that it was the absolute opposite. It was upside down. It was the opposite of what everyone expected. Hence, Jesus, king of all kings, born in humble circumstances, living a simple life, being rejected and abused and dying a criminal's death on a cross. The opposite of what was expected. And this permeates through his whole message, especially about what he said about money and wealth and status. You see, in Jesus' time, if you had wealth and status, people looked at you, I'm going to zone in on you, Rosie, people looked at you and they said, God literally likes you more. All that stuff you have, that means divine favour. I, I had a quick search of celebrity Instagrams to get some modern day examples. Now the most followed man on Instagram today is a certain Cristiano Ronaldo. Anybody heard of him? He has over 500 million followers on Instagram and apparently a net worth of about 500 million pounds, which isn't bad. The most woman is a lady called Kylie Jenner. You know all about her, Andy? No. <laughs> well, she has a measly 378 million followers, but apparently a net worth of a cool 900 million pounds. In Jesus' time, people would have looked at them and said, hey, these are surely God's favorites. But James here says, no, no, in God's kingdom, it's not that way. James 2 verse 5 says, listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? Jesus himself says in Matthew 5, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. In James 1, James says, believers who are poor have something to boast about, for God has honored them. He also says, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Now, I grew up in church, and I was taught in Sunday school, God loves us all the same, which although well-intended, isn't quite true. You see, God does show favour, just not to whom we might expect. Now, I have four kids who I do love all the same, except if one is sick or upset or has hurt themselves or has been wronged in some way. In that moment, I have a special compassion for them. And God works the same way. I've heard it described with the acronym PIPSI. If you read the whole of the Bible, you will see, although Jesus' grace is sufficient for all who put their trust in him, God has very special compassion on particular groups. First, the poor. Next, international, meaning those displaced or somehow minorities in a new land, on the edge of culture, struggling with language maybe. Prisoners, forgotten and judged by mankind, remembered by God. The sick, Sometimes God heals, sometimes he doesn't, but he always cares. And youth, Jesus said, let the children come to me. Not just the nice ones, he even meant the crying and the disruptive and the smelly ones. These were the people at the bottom of the social ladder. The people believed to have had the least favour with God. And James says, no. In God's kingdom, they have special favour, special attention. These are people who God lavishes particular compassion on. Now many of you will know that I live in an area called Weston, which is in the 5% most deprived parishes in England. One tragedy in Weston is that people speak so poorly of themselves because of the place that they live. They think they have so little value. And it's heartbreaking to hear because for the very reason they think so little of themselves, they have God's special favour. In fact, for Jesus, it's the rich for whom there's an issue. It's easier to fit through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven, he says. Arguably, many of us in this room are incredibly rich. I'm technically in the top 1% of wealth worldwide. 
despite being a part-time pizza delivery driver and my wife being a part-time charity worker. Many of us here, if we are able to pay our bills this month, as people who live in this part of the world, we are very rich. But I know loads of you love Jesus and are in the kingdom. However, Jesus knows riches and wealth can be such a barrier, a distraction. If you've ever been in church and been jealous of someone's new car or new phone, or in my case, trainers, or in general, to be honest, whatever Hudson's wearing, I'm jealous of. (laughs) Jesus knows, actually, that riches can distract you from enjoying him in his fullest. He knows that those on the margins appreciate him in a special way, and then likewise he reciprocates by lavishing special attention and care back on them. God's heart and God's kingdom are especially about those on the margins. But that leaves us with a huge challenge. Do our churches show this? James starts chapter 2 saying, My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus if you favour some people over others? So for my next point, we're going to look in on ourselves and ask, who's in the good seat? As we heard earlier, James 2 says, For example... Suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewellery, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you stand over there or else sit on the floor, well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? This summer, I heard an awful story. A family had come to faith and they joined the church and the mum had got baptised. But the week after, the minister came round to visit them. And he said, this particular aspect of your life, you need to change it now or you're not allowed back in the church. Now, I won't say what the issue was exactly, except to say it was an area of life where the mum carried a lot of pain. And what she needed was loving and prayer and welcoming Jesus into her brokenness. But that wasn't on offer from this church. That's pretty awful, you might think. But actually, even worse, it turns out that the wealthiest member of that church had told the minister to go around and say that or they would stop tithing. The pastor obeyed. And that's awful. But pastors being held to ransom, that's not unique. Also not unique, it can be churches pursuing the wealthy and influential. There are some churches that you can go to, especially in the States, where there'll be a special VIP section, where the rich and famous attendees can have pride of place and get special access to a pastor. One church I've attended in the UK has a special role called assisting, where you get to carry the pastor's bag for them, and then if the pastor gets caught in an inconvenient conversation, the person assisting gets to slip in so that the pastor can go away and do something more important. That is so not Pepsi. That is so far from God's heart. Now as a side note, I do know that we are a multicultural and multinational church. And so I do want to put in a caveat. Some cultures show honour to special guests in different and more elaborate ways. And often that can actually be an amazing display of God's love. I was once accidentally a guest of honour at an African church conference in Glasgow, as you do. Um, Long story short, they somehow noticed that I might be visiting and they looked after me. They literally took me from the back and they gave me and my friends the best seats. Even though we were scruffy, young, skint musicians, they lavished honour and love upon us and it was beautiful and it taught me what biblical hospitality could truly be. So what I'm saying comes with a big cultural caveat and it is good to welcome people. But ultimately, we need to be so wary of when we show ongoing favour to particular groups. What do you think? Why is it that we can be tempted to prioritise rich over poor? So we have greater giving, maybe? How about healthy over sick? Are those with long-term health conditions out of sight, out of mind? Are they less useful to our serving rota? Are people merely commodities to be used in churches rather than brothers and sisters to be cherished? Adults over young. Are kids just too noisy and messy? Prisoners, those with troubled pasts, are we scared of their troubled pasts coming in and ruining our nice, respectable futures? 
Why are we tempted? I think sometimes it's for some reason we think they mess up our idea, our idea of a nice, pleasant, orderly church. But Jesus' idea of a beautiful church has those people front and center. If churches where the citizens of God's, come to get, of God's kingdom come together, surely the first would be last and the last being first would totally be on display. Surely in church we'd see a whole range of backgrounds represented, especially people from the margins. But certainly in the UK, that's sadly not the case. At the moment, the church in the UK is not a church for everyone. If you speak to Rosie, who's our access lead in this church, and I love that we have that role, she'll be able to explain to you that people with disabilities are one of the largest unreached people groups in the UK. A survey in 2015 saw that 81% of church girls in the UK have a university degree, while at the same time 60% of the population identified themselves as working class. It's clear to see we're missing huge swathes of our population. And one thought that really, really has been troubling me in recent years is the fact that we worship a God who revealed himself in human form as a 30-year-old carpenter, yet probably the least likely person you'd ever find in a church in this country is a young tradesperson. And that leads us to have to look at ourselves and say, do we create kingdom culture environments where everyone has a chance of thriving regardless of background? Or do we create a church that excludes people? On a Sunday, let's think about it. Who, who do we make a beeline for to speak to? Is it the pastors? Is it the people with clout? Or are we actually looking at the back for someone on their own? Looking for someone who finds the, the logistics of a Sunday hard to cope with and trying to help them along? Are we in the welcome lounge just trying to help people connect in? At our midweek groups that we just advertised, whether you're leading one or joining one, are you trying to find a comfortable tribe? Or are you trying to build a kingdom family? And when we hang out, who is round our table or watching TV with us? Or who are we in the pub with? If an outsider walked in and observed our church life, who would they say we value the most? Would it be Pipsy or would it be Instagram? Who among us has the good seat? Which leads me to my final question. Who's on our heart? Because whoever is on our heart as individuals will be the ones we serve best and put front and centre of our church family life. So who's on our heart? And I have three practical points as we do this just to end on. One, we need to make sure that we share God's heart. Two, we need to be aware of ourselves and of our surroundings. And finally, we need to actively care for those around us in a way that truly glorifies God. So quickly, Sharing God's heart. Reflecting back on James chapter 2 that you heard earlier, verses 9 to 11, in that it compares the idea of neglecting the poor in favour of the rich as breaking God's holy law, and that's being on a par with committing murder and adultery. Now being semi-serious, if Southampton Football Club signed a Jesus-loving player on, say, 50 grand a week, and they rocked up here, We'd forgive Andy for making a bit of a fuss of them. Maybe the church roof has just caved in and needs fixing. Maybe the player is ex-Liverpool. Now, I know that's not the way that the transfer of traffic flows, but allow me. We'd think, go on, Andy, schmooze the big spender. That's the way this all works. But James says, no, this is serious. If Andy was in adultery, or especially if he murdered someone, I'd assume he wouldn't be our pastor anymore. We need to be a family who are serious about God's heart for the poor and those on the margins. Sharing it means prioritizing it and viewing it the same as these other things. Next, we need to be aware. I think a huge reason why churches struggle with this stuff is that we're just not aware of who we're excluding and how. We may have some cultural blinkers on, meaning that we make styles of church to fit what we know and what we like and not realize that we exclude others. We may not really be in conversation with anyone out of our little cultural bubble. We may just not have the experience and expertise in reaching those on the margins. But the truth is, though, if we are as serious with this as James says we should be, we have no excuse. We need to be aware of ourselves and the perspectives that we bring 
And then we need to seek to be as aware as possible of the environments we are in and the people we're trying to serve. Being practical on the ground in Western at the moment as we begin our church planting journey there, this means conversations about the times that we meet. Would that exclude a single parent? Or if someone does come along with kids, do we have childcare provided when they do come? We have a legally blind lady who attends, and it's our job to keep stressing to her that we will make any reasonable adjustments that we can. We don't want her to be feeling like she has to chase us for them. And when we gather, we put on food every time because we have to cater for the one or two amongst us that might not have had a meal that day. Because we share God's heart, we can choose to make ourselves aware of the context we are doing church in and the blinkers we might bring, so then we can do the final step, that is care. Get caring for those around us, building true family, real Jesus-knitted family that shows how God's kingdom works. And it's not with the goal of giving ourselves status by being mini saviors. Actually, this is with the goal of releasing the potential in the people around us and being blessed that the gifts they have begin to really enrich our church families. I love stories about the early days of the Salvation Armies. There's some massive heroes there. This subject is something that they absolutely excelled in. If you read the leader's training manual for them from the 1870s and 1880s, in it are amazing instructions on how to preach the gospel, how to lead a whole night of prayer. And then you turn a page and there's instructions on how to brush your teeth and how to wipe your bottom. Seriously. It's because they had faith that the people that they would save in the roughest and poorest, poorest of neighbourhoods might one day go on to be their leaders. And there was no set order for development. Hygiene and prayer came all in one. They saw the potential in the people around them, not only to find, um, not only to love and to bring in the people and to honour them, but also to invest in them until it was those very people from the margins leading them. I started this morning by telling the story of the beautiful moment in church where a mother and, ba and baby in somewhat of disgrace were welcomed into and prayed for in a church I was visiting. Now, there was a very important reason why I was visiting that church that day. And it's because that lady was my sister and the baby was my niece. And I was there to be family support. But what I found when I arrived was there was already so many people there wanting to be family for them. That church cared for them and brought them in. It was a very tough few years, but somehow years later, in God's kindness, my sister reconciled with her husbands. They remarried. They started a journey of figuring out how to love and lead a blended family. And what's more, they now lead a church of their own. And they're amazing at loving people on the margins. When we share God's heart, and we are aware of who we can love around us and how to do it, then we can get to the business of caring for others with a view to release them into who God has called them to be. So as I end, do we know God's heart for those on the margins? Who is in the good seat among us and does our church life prioritise this and how are our hearts how is your heart are we going to take this seriously to build a church family truly reflecting God's heart this weekend we're ending our 21 days of prayer and fasting and I just want to end with some verses from the book of Isaiah about how God really loves us to fast Isaiah 58 says is, this, sorry, is not this the kind of fasting I, that's God, have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke that set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then the light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear, then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Lord, may we share your heart 
And may our church reflect those who you put in the good seat and love especially. Amen.